Hey, hey Johnny, <laughs> what are you doing there? I am knitting a blanket. Whoa, that's a new habit for you. <laughs> yeah, I learned during the pandemic. That is knit. awesome. It wasn't one of my plans, but had some time. Thought, pick up a new skill. So I started. So this is this is a second panel of a blanket. So I already have one panel that's this, the same width that is probably six feet long. So I'm gonna do another six feet long with this and then I think maybe a third one and then stitch them all together. That's that's my plan. I've never done that before, so I don't know how it's gonna work out. Wow. It might what be I... three very wide scarves when it's done. <laughs> what I love about you is all your life, you have always jumped into new experiences, challenge yourself. And before we get any further in this, hello, my faithful friends and followers. I am here with a friend of mine from California, and we met at teacher orientation in 1990, first person out of the gate that I met, and it's been a great lifelong friendship, really great. You're going to in for a treat today, listening to John's stories. Um, maybe that, that would be kind of leads into our stupid innocent story, right? When we both showed up at orientation and we were just like wide-eyed and bushy-tailed and <laughs> yeah. hi, 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 what's your name? Hi, I'm John. Hi, <laughs> hi, hi. So feel free to elaborate on that meeting. It was August of 1990 and I was going back to teach at the school district where I attended. So I knew my way around and I meet Amy at the new teacher orientation. They put all the new high school teachers together. I think there were 14 of us. And we sat next to each other and started talking. And because I knew my way around, I knew the names of the people. I, and I reassured her that it's going to be OK. Uh, we kind of stuck together yeah. through that, that nope. first year. And I think helped both of us make it through that hardest year of teaching. Yes, and we also we did some co coach. Uh, we were advisors for the freshman like the we freshman class for a while, and we had a lot of. That's fun. how they get you. They ask you during orientation <laughs> when you're a brand new teacher and you're trying to impress. They ask you to make those big time commitments. And right, right. Everyone's eager to jump and say yes, sure, I'll do that. Yeah, yeah. You can never say <laughs> no as a young teacher, so no. that's funny. Um, I also remember we did some faculty follies together, which. <laughs> which is if you don't know what that is it's like um lip syncing contest with a bunch of teachers that would do this for a fundraiser so got some ideas we can help you out with some of that performance but yeah, and they brought out. it they were bringing it back for the last year of my teaching and i was all set to perform i was gonna do i was gonna do little nas x nice <laughs> and Amy, yeah. i don't know if you've heard that song i was going to do that song as my uh my swan song and then the pandemic shut us down and we didn't get to do faculty follies. Which this whole show is pretty much the stupid situation shift that you were in at the end yes. when you retired. But before we do that, I want to talk about, if you notice, John is knitting and retired. And Amy, <laughs> Amy is planning not to retire for at least five more years because she wasn't as smart with buying. I needed to, I moved to Illinois, so I bought, I didn't buy my years and whatever, you know, if you don't know what that means, you just, you got to buy your service credit in California. And I never did that. And I'm in the process of doing that now. So then now I'll have a full pension. But because of that, I, um, I can't retire at 55, even though I just turned 55, but I can take advantage of those ARP discounts, can't I? <laughs> what discounts have you uh, even noticed in 50, at 55? Um, I haven't really noticed any because I turned 55 back in March and just starting to get back out and head, head out to places. But I'll tell you before I was 55, maybe even three years ago, so 52, I was noticing that I would, at the drive-through for El Pollo Loco, <laughs> it's not a commercial for El Pollo Loco, <laughs> I would order and they would give me my total. And I would pull up to the window and then the the teenager behind the cash register would give me my total and it was a different amount. 
and I noticed on the receipt it said one dollar off senior discount. <laughs> Could they see you on camera or something? They know because they, he would change it when I pulled forward. It would be a different amount that he said at the when I was at the speaker. Wow! So you can't be offended there, right? You're saving money. Oh no, I'm money. mad. I was You're mad. mad. Dollar. <laughs> They should, they say, all of our customers look so young. If you're eligible for senior discount, please let us know at the window. Not just <laughs> see some gray hair and assume that the person's a senior and gets a dollar off. <laughs> I love you, John, your stories. Oh my gosh, this, this, this has just always been fun talking to you. <laughs> um, so that kind of segues into, I got to hear. John was planning to retire in May of 2020. And as you all know, March, everything shut down. So because of that, he wasn't able to have his proper goodbye. And I know years past, John, you did, I know you told me this thing where you did with everybody got a, a little slip of construction paper and wrote a note to you and you had it hanging around the room and every day you would pull a ring off of the old, the old fashioned construction paper chains. Is that the last year or that was the year before you did it? I did, I did one year. I knew I was retiring in 2020. So from my birthday in 2019, my students decorated my classroom and they made a chain of brightly colored paper where you make the little links and staple them together. And so at the end of that school year, I pulled it apart and got 180 pieces of it and gave them to my students and said, this is my yearbook, write something nice to me. And I'm going to staple it back together and hang it in my classroom next year and then open one of them every day. And so I did that. It was a visual reminder of the year progressing. It was also a real great boost every morning to read something nice that a student wrote to me the year before. And since most of my students were still on campus, they would come by and ask me, have you opened my ring yet? Have you seen it yet? And I taught a two-year program. So many of the students were also in my classroom. And so when I would open their ring and then see them that day, I would say, I op opened it today. And I said, oh, did you like what I wrote? And so it was really nice, uh, a nice activity for me in the morning. If I was feeling a little down because it was so early in the morning, I got to work at six o'clock in the morning every day. Uh, it would just be a nice boost to, to the day. Uh, and oh, then man. when we were told that we were being shut down for a couple of weeks, I took off two weeks worth of rings and brought them home with me. Cause I continued teaching. I started right away the first day with, um, with conferences with my students. And so I was opening a ring every day. After I think about a month, they let us back to our classrooms and I got the rest of the chain, caught myself back up to where I was and then continued to do that for the rest of the year. Um, I knew that that was for my last year of teaching but I'd recommend that all teachers do that. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Could you do that day? Write something. Could you do it day one with kids that don't even know you though? Or would you do No, it? I'd just say at the end of the year, just do it with the kids who know you really well. Oh, yeah. And then, then you have next it next year. Next year. Yeah. I and the kids, the, the kids in your class will see that and they'll ask questions. What is that on the wall? Why is that there? Why is it getting shorter? Uh, yes. And then they'll look forward to adding to it for the next year. It could also be an activity you do in the first day, everybody writes a message to the class and then you read a message to the class. That's, but that, that would make, but if you have five classes, 180 days times five, <laughs> that's a lot of chain link, right? Oh, right. Right. Oh, maybe not such a good idea, but I love your idea. And I love how the kids love your birthday and always decorate or take care of you <laughs> on your birthday. Um, but that's one thing I really do love is the way you connect with your students. And I don't know if there's anything like that we can do to help young teachers or teachers that don't have a lot of EI, emotional intelligence, <laughs> or what can we do to help either connect just with each other or students if you're a teacher? I no, I think, I think new teachers are in such a sink or swim mentality that 
connecting with students often gets pushed to the side. Yeah. Because the state mandates, the school curriculum, the evaluation, the community evaluation, all of those things are are on the front burner. They have to be on the front burner. And the one thing that gets pushed to the back is making those connections with students because that's not part of the evaluation process. That's not a state mandate. That's not something that is being tested on the standardized testing. Uh, but it's the number one crucial factor, I think, to being an effective right. teacher. Right. Mm. Uh, and it's, it's tough because we can, we can talk about how important that is, but the, you're not hearing that in your department meetings, you're not hearing that in the staff meetings, and it's not in the emails. It's all about your, your evaluation is due this day, your lesson plans have to be turned in by this day, and it's just, it's, it's hard to, to bring all those things together. Yeah, that's true, because then and they're exhausted from grading at night, so they have no energy. And I think, unfortunately, what happens is then the habits that you developed during your first year of teaching are the habits that carry that you carry through your second year of teaching and your third year of teaching. And if you just didn't, didn't build a habit of, mm. of working with kids and one and one in a rapport with students, I'm not talking about being their friends because they don't need they don't need you to be a friend. No, they need you to be friendly. Yeah, but they they have their friends. They need a a good mentor somebody who cares about them, somebody who is going to go to bat for them, who's interested in them, but maintains that teacher-student relationship. Yeah. Give us then, because of the habits, okay, they develop these habits. Um, I know our school is really big on social emotional learning now, and actually it's going to be added to our evaluation, um, yeah. which I think is great. What advice do you give for a first-year teacher or even a veteran? Not everything is going to be perfect. So don't beat yourself up when things aren't perfect. There are going to be those lessons that just fall flat. And what you do is you just decide to make notes at the end of the day about how you're going to change it up for the next year. Don't wait until the next year to try to remember back to what worked and what didn't work. Take good notes and realize that the next year it'll be better. I like And that. it's okay even in the day that period three was better than period two. Don't Usually. keep repeating the mistake. If you realize that you that there's dead time in the middle of the lesson, don't do that again, third period and then fourth period and fifth period, just to keep it all the same. Right. Feel free to change it up. And right. maybe if you have five periods of the same class, that's five chances to practice and perfect. And it's not gonna be perfect at the end of the fifth period, but <laughs> it'll be better than the, than the first time you did it. And then the next year will be even better. If you can improve a small percentage of your lessons every year and realize that it's going to take years before you feel like I'm doing a really good job with everything I'm doing, yeah. just be okay with that. And share with your, with your colleagues, don't be afraid. Don't, don't put a, that persona up. I'm the perfect teacher. I don't make any mistakes. Be okay with going to your colleagues and saying, I don't know what I'm doing with this. This mm -hmm. is hard. Uh, help me. You have a good lesson plan for this activity. I can't think of something. Mm -hmm. And be willing to share back. With yes. things that work. Well, as a perfectionist, mm -hmm. you must be in recovery because I know that you, how, did you, <laughs> how did you get to that place? Well, for the last 25 years of my teaching, I taught, I was a singleton where I didn't have the same course as anybody else did. I was the only AP chemistry teacher at the school. Uh, I taught honors by myself for a number of years. And then uh, for the last few years, another teacher taught honors. I taught a technology program where I was the only teacher teaching that technology program. So I didn't have anybody to help. Uh, but by that point, it was my, my sixth year of teaching that I started that, I was in much better shape than my first year of teaching. Yes, 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 yes. Um, it's funny how we always say 
poor first period, right? Because they don't <laughs> get the best lesson. And then I know that I've heard this before, try to do your lesson. It messes with your mind, but try to do your first lesson like the last period of the day, the day before. Then the next day you're ready because you've already done it once, but then you have to start brand new for the next lesson than the last right. period of the day. So that it, it, but at least first period, it doesn't get the worst lesson all the time. But what I've also heard is um, whatever your prep period is. Start after that. Start the period after that. Mm -hmm. Make the prep period be your morning. Yeah, that's a good and point. So if it's fourth period, yeah. fifth and sixth with the new lesson, yeah. the next morning you are um, continuing with your early classes and then prepping again during four. And not it, a bad idea. It the pressure off because yeah, because you don't have the evening pressure then. You don't have the evening pressure and you don't have the, I've got to get in there in the morning when everybody else is the copy machines to make these copies of this handout that I'm right. using with my and that starts in 15 minutes right. and the machine is jammed. <laughs> right. You know that's the way it is. <laughs> oh man. Okay. Any more advice before we move on? One other piece of advice I think it and it goes to that making connections with students. That DOG. Is that DOG? We got to yeah, say hi to DOG. Is it going to be because her ball is under the couch? <laughs> and she wants me to get her ball for her. So Give it to her. Do, do it. So let me get her ball for her. DOG <laughs> is spelled D-O-G-G-I-E, right? No, it's, um, it's much fancier than that. Oh. I'm just trying to find my There name. she no. is. Cute. How do you spell it? D O G. Okay, it's capital D E E, capital O with an accent on it, <laughs> H, capital G E E. I don't want to cut this. This is too precious. <laughs> All right, D O G. She's playing. <laughs> She's playing. She. She's out all morning. She didn't want to play. And oh now, my gosh. I know. Busy, she, she went to play. I know. Do Dookie, he went in his closet. He's 16 and barely can walk now. So he's, uh, oh. he saw that my podcast set setup was happening. He just went, I'm going in the closet. So he's not <laughs> bugging me. Okay. So we mentioned before that we were class advisors that first year. That's something I would recommend to new teachers to, to get involved in an established club. Yes. or group on campus right away because that's how you make connections with kids it's a smaller group of students and you'll make connections with a small group maybe that first year and it doesn't add too much to your workload if you are joining an established group as a co-advisor um wait i hear i hear a baby crying is that d-o-g <laughs> that is c-a-t That's right. You have your CATs. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. Okay, just so everybody knows, I don't want to make sure anybody's crying in the in the house. We're good. So then you said get involved then in a in a small in a in a club as an advisor or some kind, and that you'll make connections. Right. Yes, I wouldn't suggest being a coach for an athletic team because that adds so much um, to your workload that first year. A class advisor, like a graduating class advisor, that is really time consuming. But just a small club that, I mean, a uh, chess club, the an anime club, uh, just something that is, that's going to meet once a month and small group of kids, a co-advisor to, yes. to commiserate with. It, I think that can, would be really helpful. Can I can I ask you tips on fundraising? Because that used to be the bane of my existence when I was a club advisor is collecting money from the fundraiser. In California, things change so much with not being able to sell junk food. So our biggest fundraisers were selling chips and candy. You can't do that anymore in California. Oh, really? So they have to sell healthy snacks. Oh. Which, wow. it, yeah, it's... It's really fundraising is so much more difficult now you, than it was. You always we were, had like 
one week you your club would sell that week and then there's always a kid in the, in the room that would just be selling from his own from his own personal stash exactly. Exactly. <laughs> and then you had to regulate that i was mm -hmm. like i'm done i can't deal with that. <laughs> remember pizza sales yeah uh, they don't do that anymore either because wow. you can't sell pizza on campus because wow. it's not healthy wow so, i do remember uh, the gum i think i took i brought this up in my last podcast but gum regulation remember that year gum was i know i was teaching drama but the year gum was like a rule because we had that principle that said we need to regulate gum so of course i regulated gum and i seriously was so high strung tense stressed out and i remember wanting to regulate people in the airport and at the store right? <laughs> anywhere i saw somebody chewing gum i just couldn't stop myself so i said forget that it's not worth it to be on that high strong right That's that is true. All right, let's transition now into okay. one question that I want you one last thing for, about your students, and then we'll talk about what you're going to do in retirement. We'll close with a three, two, one. Um, what is one message that maybe you didn't get out? I know you were able to meet via Zoom when you said goodbye, but you know, knowing you, you, you would have had a huge party. If May 2020, you would have gone out with a bang. I know that a parade with fire trucks, everything, <laughs> the band. What is one thing you didn't get a chance to say to your students before you left? I didn't get to say goodbye in person. And that's what I really wanted to do. I fortunately, the principal for the graduating class of 2020 asked me if I would participate in the virtual graduation. And so the graduation the started off. I can hear the OT really bad. <laughs> The graduation started off with uh, her flipping a, an electrical switch to turn on the stadium lights. And then they did the graduation ceremony. <clears throat> I'm not getting choked up. <clears throat> I'm just like swallowed a frog. Um, <laughs> so let's cut that. Um, As so a science sorry. teacher, it's funny you just said that, <clears throat> sorry. Have you dissected a frog lately? Um, I don't think I don't think I ever did a frog. Oh, you've done cats. Yeah. Never did a cat, thankfully. Yeah, I couldn't imagine. Yeah. Okay, so I'm um, back. So the principal started the graduation ceremony by on on video flipping a giant switch and turning on the stadium lights. Yeah. And then they the recorded speeches from the valedictorian salutatorian. Then they had every student's picture come up on screen as they presented the, the virtual graduation. I went in to be filmed turning the switch off oh, at the end of the ceremony. That is and so the, great. The stadium switching off. Um, and I was able to talk to them for 20 seconds just to say that it was time for me to say goodbye as well. And that I was proud of them and that I wish I could say goodbye in person, but um, but I wish them wish them well for their future. That's beautiful. We had a, a thing this year where we had to commit. It's February 2022, but that we have to commit by 2030 when we're going to leave. And I got so emotional thinking about leaving and, and what, 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 wait, 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 I got to commit? I have a commitment phobia. What are you talking about? I got to commit. <laughs> and I was like, I still haven't figured it out yet. I think I had the number in my head, but um I think that's so great, John. Did you feel like when you made the commitment that you had that same kind of trepidation? I did, but I, I knew it was time that because I, my, my dad died when he was really young mm. and we have had so many teachers from our school who have died in their last year of teaching or died within a year of retiring because they just kept pushing it and pushing it until they were mm -hmm. in their 60s and uh, health issues were taking over. And I didn't want to be in that same situation. So I wanted to retire when I still loved my job. Mm -hmm. And I absolutely loved it. Not every day, but I loved my job. I loved the kids. Uh, and my last year of teaching was one of my best years mm. of all my students in end of January, early February that I was going to be retiring. I wanted to make sure that my 
students who were the first year in my program knew that it had nothing to do with them, that I would have loved to have stayed to be their teacher for the second year of the program, but because they were such an amazing group of students. And they said, well, then stay. It was such, if you had such a good year, you should stay and then wait until you have a bad year. And then I had them think about what they just said. And I said, do you, do you think that's really the best way to leave a job is leave on a bad note? And I didn't want to do that. I didn't want to leave when I was angry with at students and hating my job and just dreading going in each day. I didn't want to get to that point. You're like um, an not, athlete. Not that, yeah, not, not that I think that, abs- that that's what everybody's trajectory is. I, I know many teachers who retire, you know, into their 60s and they love their job all the way to the end. Um, mm-hmm. That's not, I'm not saying that that's what yeah. happens to everybody, but yeah. uh, I didn't want to have a bad year and then say, okay, well, but this is the year that I go in a bad year. Yeah, when great I, point. Year. It's probably better to commit then, right? Because you can make or break that year just by a decision and a mindset saying, this is my last year. I'm going to ride with it, roll with it, and not Again, that's advice for young teachers. You may have a bad first five years, but it's only a matter of your attitude going in. I think your attitude yeah. is so, so crucial. Oh, yes. I, I tried every year to start off the year with, this is my best year ever. Nice. And unfortunately, I had colleagues who within a couple of weeks would say, oh, this group of students are the worst I've ever had. Mm-hmm. And I just thought, gosh, that's, that's going to be a self-fulfilling prophecy right there. Yes. Because you think they're the worst. You, you can, you're looking for evidence of that every day. And whenever I say that, my worst class always ends up being the best class. So now when I know, when I have a lot of that personality or a lot of that attitude, I'm always knowing you're geniuses and you're not being challenged. And that's why you're frustrated. So I'm going to bring it. And we end up having the best time. The worst class becomes my best every year, whatever that's that right. means worst best right wow good okay I think think the part of the best class last year was when I would go to meetings staff meetings and they would talk about the changes that are happening next year and I knew I wasn't going to be there it was so easy just to smile and say great (laughs) that's the new requirement that's going to be great (laughs) we always have new requirements right every year it's like another new requirement another new and they would talk about them all throughout the whole year this is what's happening next year this is the change is coming right and i would just smile and people people who didn't know i was leaving were thinking what is going on with him he's usually he's usually clapping back with why are we doing this this doesn't make (laughs) sense but he's just smiling <laughs> well, then I hope you're keeping smiling in retirement because oh, absolutely, you have such great creativity with what you're going to do. What are your plans for retirement? And then we'll get in the three, two, one, some of your top favorite things, and then we'll close. Okay, so most of my my retirement plans have been put on hold because of the pandemic, but in no particular order. Travel. I want to be. Um, in the docent program at the Los Angeles Zoo, because I think that will, that'll uh, meet my need to teach. Mm. And I love animals and the Los Angeles Zoo, if you haven't been there, it is very hilly. So walking around a couple of days a week up and down those hills of the of Griffith Park will keep me physically active. Perfect. Uh, I want to get into improv classes. Yes. Um, I'm a photographer, so continuing my photography is really important to me. And uh, Disneyland. Oh, yes. The year passed. You got me to go there for a year past. I did a few years with you. Yeah. It was fun. Uh, and the all-night parties, of course, too. Those were great. You talked me into a lot, John. I love that about you. <laughs> um, <laughs> So tell us then, then let's do the three, two, one, which is connected to those things. We have three places to travel, two animals at the zoo and one improv game. What three places should we travel to? I love Buenos Aires. I've been there a couple of times and that's the plan is to go back there. Uh, I definitely am planning a trip to South Africa. Mm. Uh, we were scheduled to go in January, 
but the, the trip was just canceled by the organizer because of COVID issues in South Africa, but mm -hmm. that's on the bucket list. Mm -hmm. And then I want to hit every Disney park around the world. Wow. I think Paris is coming up first. Amazing. How about two animals at the zoo we need to see? Snow leopards. If your zoo has snow leopards, they're just gorgeous animals. Um, and they're, you, have to, you have to look for them. They're gonna be pretty well hidden in their enclosure, but they're, they're beautiful animals. And then tigers. I'm, I'm into the big cats. Yeah, I see that because you have a bunch of little cats. A bunch of little cats, yes. Wow. Good to know, because I don't think it, there's a Lincoln Park Zoo that's free down the street that- We went to Lincoln Park Zoo together. You, we did? Yes, huh. we did, when I came to visit you in Chicago. My brain. We went to the Lincoln Park Zoo. We did, <laughs> we did. Well, I'm glad, I'm glad. Now I live downtown, so it would have been better had we had you visited when I lived downtown. <laughs> You're still welcome to join, come again. Um, all right, one, improv game that we all need to play? I think my favorite is called Four Corners. It's kind of complicated to explain, but in Four Corners, every person in the scene participates in two completely different scenes and it switches back and forth. You're in one scene with another player, maybe it is firefighters who have fallen in love. And then with a quick change from the referee, you are now uh, a cat in a um, house that has 500 cats with the crazy cat lady as your, as your scene partner. <laughs> and you go back and forth, so it reverse, now you're back as that firefighter again, and it's just some time later than the, the previous portion of the scene. So it's, it keeps you jumping and back and forth and having to keep two separate scenes with two completely different characters in mind and switching, uh, like somebody's changing the channel. It's, it's pretty fun yeah. to be really great for the audience because they see four different scenes cut up into little uh, snippets. Uh, so it's, it's, it's pretty amazing. That does sound good. It reminds me of the activator one where you're, there's one person in this corner, another person in that corner, and then you're the one that jumps from scene to scene. So you just keep going oh. from this scene to that scene. They're not connected at all, but there's a million improv games, but yeah, yeah, that's cool. I hope you definitely get on stage again with your improv. I hope so too. <laughs> oh, John, this has been so fun talking to you. I appreciate it's been you great so talking much for to your you. wisdom. This is great. John, sure. thank you. Thank you so much for meeting with me today. It's been so you for having to me. have you. Yes. So we'll talk soon. Okay. Absolutely. Bye. Take care. Bye-bye.